You're very welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast. I'm delighted today to welcome uh, the legendary Leinster, former Leinster Connacht and Irish rugby player Bernard Jackman. Uh, Bernard, it's brilliant to have you on today. Oh, lads, thanks for the, thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the chat. Great stuff. Um, we've got Ross Bennett as well, head of performance with QPR Academy. And Joe Coulter got sacked last week. Bernard, he, he was off the podcast because we were talking about sports science and max speed. And then yeah. it went out all over Twitter that people were wanting to find out what, what does Joe think about Max Speed and how's Joe's tin, virtual Tinder life going? And <laughs> so by popular demand, he's, he's back with us today. You have to give the public what they want. <laughs> <laughs> people power. That's what it is. <laughs> so Ross and Joe, good, good to have you back on again. No worries, kids. Thanks, mate. Welcome back, Joe. Good to have you up. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kieran, for that intro as well. Uh, good to have you on, Bernard. Thank you. Okay, Bernard, we'll, ju- we'll jump straight into it. So you were, you were a Leinster man who played with Connacht. Then you were an Irish player who went over and played with Sale Sharks. And finally then an, an Irish rugby coach who went over to Grenoble in France and, and the Dragons in Wales. Did, was there a bit where... Did you feel a bit like you were the odd man out at any stage going into Leinster as a as a, a tallow man down from Carlo coming up to, to the D4 lads? Or how did you feel right throughout your career in that sense? Yeah, look, I think um, I've always gone where the opportunity was. And um, for me as a rugby player, I like to play. Um, and I was very conscious of you know, where the best opportunity was for me to, to get regular game time or to go somewhere to improve improve my game. Um, so I am a Leinster man and, you know, my dream was always to play for Leinster. But when and I was playing club rugby in Clontarf when rugby were professional, um, I was supposed to go to Japan. I was studying Japanese in, in Dublin City University. I, was, I did two years in Dublin City University. Then I was supposed to go to Japan for a year, come back and do another year and then I would have my degree. Rugby went professional. Warren Gatland uh, needed a hooker to go to Connacht. And um, I played against him that year. He'd been player coach for Galwegians. And uh, he remembered me. And he, and he gave me a call. And he said, look, there's an opportunity here for you. Uh, at that stage, the IRFU didn't really want to go professional. Um, World Rugby had taken a vote on it. The IRFU had voted no. But um, professionalism came in anyway. And we started off very slowly. So the first year in Ireland, there was only 20 players contracted professionally. Five in each province. Um, and the rest were part-time. So Warren said to me, look, at you can be one of only you know, 20 players in Ireland who were ever professional because we didn't know if it would last. I mean, effectively, it was taste and see. So um, he said, you know, take this opportunity. I'll let you finish off your, your degree in DCU and, and something else. So I, I transferred into business studies. And uh, yeah, I had a go at it. And then when I finished my degree, Warren had moved to Ireland um, and there was another coach in there. I wasn't really enjoying that. And the opportunity came to go to Manchester. I'm a Man United fan. Um, and uh, also at the time, the Premiership was probably more professional. I did a very good SNC coach, a guy called Marty Hume, um, who came from Australia, was, had worked with Wigan Warriors, worked with Australia, Australia at Rugby League, which was probably ahead of Rugby Union for sure in terms of the conditioning side of it. So I just said, look, I'm 21. Um, I need to get myself in, my, into the type of shape to play for Ireland or play for Leinster or whoever. And there was a two-year contract on the table. And, you know, I finished my degree. Why not go over there and, and just taste something else? And, um, yeah, so, and then obviously coming home to Leinster, when the opportunity arose, you know, I wanted to, I've been very envious. So when I was in Sale and when I was in Connacht, I was playing the Challenge Cup, which is the second-tier competition. Um, and I was very envious of Munster, uh, particularly, but also Leinster, um, getting to, to play those big games, you know, in, uh, on certain weekends and, and play as the best in, in Europe. So, that was two parts of my, my, my dream was to obviously play for my home province, but also to, to play in the Heineken Cup and hopefully win one. Yeah. Did, did you find that your experience in Sale Sharks then, that you, you stepped outside your comfort zone, didn't you, in some ways, and you challenged yourself to, to make it in another country? Did that help you then when you came back to Leinster? Yeah, for sure. Look, I, I've all, I, I was sent to boarding school at 12, so I've always been quite independent. And, um, you know, I do think you learn a lot about yourself by putting yourself into, into, I suppose, different situations. Look, it's not 
rock it's not hard i mean ruby dressing rooms or ruby dressing rooms yeah. ga dressing rooms soccer dressing rooms so it's not like you know i really set myself off to north pole or something like that but um i did i do enjoy going out making new friends making new connections finding out how you know other people see things you know and probably france was was probably the you know the next level on that in terms yeah. of going somewhere with no language um i did german in school unfortunately and yeah. uh you know backing yourself or putting pressure on yourself to be able to coach people in a as quick as possible in their native language yeah yeah how tell us a little bit about leinster then because that was during a really successful period wasn't it or, or at least the kind of the beginning of a really yeah. really conveyor belt of successful teams and yeah we had we had a lot of work to do um so i, I would have joined 2005 and um to be honest we were seen as a as a group of uh, of nearly men um you know we'd been to semi-finals finals in europe we had good draws i mean there was one stage I can't remember what year it was. I wasn't there, but uh, we had a home quarterfinal, home semifinal, home final in Europe in, in the Champion Ireland Cup. But we blew the semifinal um, and missed a massive opportunity to um, to obviously win it. Then Munster won in 2006, 2008, and we were seen as we were seen as soft, maybe mentally mentally weak, uh, posh, um, no real spine. Uh, a lot of negative stuff that you don't want yeah. to, uh, you to be associated with. So we had to go through the process of of kind of cleaning up the dressing room a little bit in terms of internally, in terms of our own acceptance of mediocrity. And also, in fairness, Cheka, the, the head coach, he he got rid of people who had good talent but just didn't have the, the drive and hunger. So uh, it was really good being part, for me, as, a, as someone who's fascinated by high performance and, and culture, to see the hard steps that are sometimes necessary uh, to change something. And also the longevity. I mean, I joined 2005. In terms of talent, we could have, we should have won 2005, um, uh, but we didn't win anything until 2008. We won a Magnus League, which is now the Pro 14, or, um, as Pro 12 then, and then 2009 we won a Heineken Cup. But I mean, even that, like, even those two trophies, it wasn't all plain sailing. I mean, in the 2009 uh, Cup campaign, um, we lived out of our group stages. We got an away draw to Harlequins in the quarter final. Um, and obviously that was Bloodgate. You know we won that match six uh, five, and then we went into the Munster semi final against our semi final against the Munster Crow Park, yeah. like massive underdogs. Um, and then we won that, and obviously we uh, we won the final as well. But like during that year, there was times when when you know things were very tough. We lost confidence. Um, we doubted ourselves. There was internal probably challenging, uh, but you know you have to go through those. Uh, and you have to have good people around you to to get over those barriers and and finally get success. Yeah, was that semi final against Munster? Was that a kind of a, a seminal game in that team's development? I mean, I remember I went to university in in University of Limerick, and it was all about Munster rugby at that stage. And even for probably all Irish people, you nearly felt like Munster was your team, and yeah. and they were successful, and they were the people's team. Whereas Leinster were probably like you say known prior to that as like highly talented but a little bit soft and a lot of lads coming from the the boarding schools in south dublin and everything like that must have been a really huge hurdle to kind of get over then yeah but it was and i actually i think that was important as well and how we how we reacted to that so i'll bring it back a bit so munster won the first time in cup in 2006 but he had about 10 years of trying to win it and they never went down without a fight. Um, so the fans travelled, you know, the length and breadth of, of France and, and England supporting them. And they couldn't get over the final hurdle. They couldn't get over that last hurdle or, or second last hurdle. Yeah. But people left the stadium proud and a feeling of attachment to the team. I remember even even me. So we, when I was playing in Connacht in 2000, or maybe 2000, Munster played Northampton and Twickenham in a Heineken Cup final. And we drove, about three cars drove from Connacht to Twickenham uh, on a ferry, like I don't think any Leinster players would have went to follow them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we found part of that that they were Irish men, they were, you know, they were um, good people, and you know, it was worth giving them their support. Uh, and then when I got so we played Munster in 2006 in a um, it's called Black Sunday actually in Leinster um, in a High Cup semi final in Lansdowne Road, and we got absolutely hammered. I had a broken leg. Uh, I broke my leg against Connacht, so I didn't play. Um, and uh, I remember being in the crowd that day and just feeling 
absolutely embarrassed to be part of of, of Leinster at the time because well, it was two things. One was the crowd was about ninety percent Munster, um, and uh, and the other part was obviously our performance. But I remember when we kind of had a post mortem in that game, some of the some of the group were basically you know pissed off or angry with the Leinster fans who supported Munster. So people from Wexford, Limerick, Tullow, um supported Munster and. You know, I, I, there was certain, certainly an element of, uh, of, of, I suppose, counter-argument in the dressing room that if we want to support, we have to earn it, you know. Um, and uh, it's basically how they identify with us um, as, as people. Uh, and you know yourself, people follow people. So um, either what we do off the field or what we do on the field can influence them and, and I suppose, warrant their support. And so our, our, our kind of goal then was to get out in the community more um, you know, we had open training sessions, basically, you know, 12, 12 counties um, and not just be focused on Dublin 4 and, and, and probably the demographic of the team, you know, people like Ty Furlong in the academy and, and Sean O'Brien and, and myself and Shane Horgan, etc. Um, started to come through. Uh, so there was more of a mix in the dressing room. Um, and more importantly, we started to be a bit more dogged in games uh, and, you know, we didn't crack when the pressure came on. And I think... When we, in 2008 and 2009 then, I mean, we had, the crowd was probably 60-40, but the people who were there, the 40% who were there were absolutely avid and, and diehard Leinster fans because we built them up. And I think that was important as well. But it, again, it's, it, the reason it's, it's interesting is probably initially we had a blame culture where we went, oh, that's, that's bullshit. They're from Leinster, why aren't they following Leinster? Whereas the reality is, you know, it was up to us to give them something to follow. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's really important to, for players to understand that effectively we have massive opportunities to, I suppose, not motivate, but yeah, give give people you know a feel good factor if we commit. And uh, yeah, it was that match was was absolutely massive because I think we it was a game we couldn't lose. If we had a loss, Michael Checker probably would have been let go. And then a new coach comes in, and the whole thing starts again. You know, and. Uh, um, a lot of our players as well probably knew that was our best chance of winning one, so uh, we we couldn't let the chance slip. Yeah, the the the, the feeling of the, the the franchise of Leinster is is slightly different, isn't it? And it probably was. It went back to that period, like you say, where yourself and Sean O'Brien and Tyg Furlong is from my own club down in Wexford, and Shane Horgan from County Meath, yeah. and they brought a different kind of feeling to the whole setup, didn't they? And and that probably helped to bring in fans from different parts of, of the province, which is a huge province. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, like, that's, that's the most pleasing thing is that like, if, if I, if I drove down to Wexford now, you know, uh, you could see a fellow wearing a Leinster jersey, whereas before you could see him wearing a Munster jersey. I remember we used to go to our Christmas parties in Kenny, which is in Leinster. And um, like, obviously they had a connection with Munster through Mick Galway and Ian Dowling, but yeah. I mean, they hated us, you know, um, and th- th- that's fine. Like, they, that's that's obviously back on us again in terms of how we came across. But um, yeah, I, I think that's that's certainly changing. Um, and look, you can take it two ways. You can say we don't need to change it. it. It only matters what happens inside the group. But I think the strongest movements and and and, and the strongest uh, success stories is about bringing a big team with you, um, bringing as many people as possible not just from the monetary point of view but just making a really important um you know on a monday that you're playing for something bigger than yourself so um you know on a monday when you train i mean uh so yeah i i, I do think that has been a, a massive shift and look at leinster probably will never be popular everywhere because you know capital teams generally aren't you know it's the same in paris stade francais ras 92 same in, in australia with the waratahs same in new zealand with Auckland blues but, you know, it's not about being popular. It's about, I suppose, you know, inspiring your own people. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in how you, you said that you, as, as a group of players, kind of cleaned out the dressing room. And obviously, you had a very strong-minded head coach in Michael Checker. But how did you do that? And what were some of the issues that were in the dressing room? Like, what, was there any sense of a divide between the city and the country? Or just was it... In terms uh, I wasn't really of the city in the country. It was probably more internationals, non internationals, to be honest. So, effectively, um, I think there was probably a, a feeling or a culture where the internationals, um, 
you didn't treat Leinster as a as a way of getting fit for for Ireland, but you did, you didn't always feel that the, it was the same level of importance. And I'm not talking about obviously for a big big match, you know, it was yeah. important. But I'm talking about like a a, a league a league match, you know that. Um, you know, were they always committed to playing, you know, were they mind themselves with a knock or whatever. And some of that come, came from above. But um, what needed to change was, you know, a, a real commitment to Leinster first, you know, and uh, and also just in terms of socialising and um, in terms of, you know, being consistent at training and holding each other to account. So, like, I'll give an example. I mean, probably my, my first couple of years in Leinster on a Monday morning match review, you know, you went in there going, I wonder will he show that missed tackle I made in the in the 16 minute or that crooked line out I throw because you know we I don't know what obviously I presume that you guys don't watch every minute of action in a game you know the coach would pick out um, certain clips that were that need reviewing so obviously as an individual you could sometimes get away with um, an error or not knowing your detail or or being lazy. Um, and that and that culture's changed. I mean, I remember 2008, 2009, before Cheka could start off the, the presentation, fellas were putting their hand up and saying, look at, you know, that that missed uh, play on in the in the 30 minute where he didn't want to block a nine, that's not unacceptable. So you just had that. And also if if you didn't put your hand up, um, it wasn't Cheka who was going to give you a bollock and it was one of the other players. So like we, you know, um we had a real attitude of like just hold each other to account all the time. So, um, like you know, a bad a bad throw at a training on Tuesday. Like I get an evil stare from Leo, um, and but we're still mates. We're still friends. It was just understanding that for that hour you're on the pitch or half an hour you're in the gym doing a, a line out session, you need to be on the money. Um, so that was probably self police to a certain extent, but it didn't come. It came from Cheka, just like constantly, constantly holding us to account about standards and, and excellence. Um, and eventually we embraced ourselves and started to, you know, um, start to run it, run it as well. So you had powerful, you had internally and then externally for coaching staff. And, um, you know, the, the improvement that that brought about was probably only about 10%, but that 10% is the difference between winning and losing. Yeah, there's a, it's brilliant when a group of players actually are driving standards themselves, isn't it? It makes such a difference. Fast forward a little bit, like one of the most famous rugby coaches in the world over the last 20 years or longer, Warren Gatlin, Lions coach, uh, Welsh, co- uh, Wales national team. And you were lucky enough that he, he kind of took you under his wing a little bit, didn't he, in terms of your playing career, but also bringing it into your coaching career also. Yeah, and again, like I, I lost contact with him. I mean, I used to see him at some games um, when I was doing some media work and we'd have a little chat. But uh, um, he was he was always there if I needed a bit of advice. And uh, like Warren, Warren, Warren's a really good good guy. Probably doesn't say a lot. Um, you know, he, he he's economical with his with his words. But um, generally, if what he does tell you is you know is, is really informative and, and really knowledgeable. So. Um, yeah, he was he was great, and and, and you know he was looking out for me. I met him when I was coaching in France. Um, you know, we had a we had a good chat, and he, he said, "Look, at, he's been watching some of our games, and he liked the way we were playing." Um, you know, we had a good <clears throat> good chat around why and how, etc. And um, and that's that's what again, like uh, at the moment, like people like Gatlin, Stuart Lancaster, Eddie Jones, Wayne Smith, who were probably the, the leaders in 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 our game. Um, you know, they're always looking to understand more and ask questions. Uh, not that they learn from me, but they they see things and they want to understand like what's behind it. Um, and even though they're out there giving a huge amount back at the moment during COVID in terms of educating coaches, etc. Um, and it's amazing. The really good coaches and managers are sharing all the time. And it's the average ones who, who try and hide and, and pretend they've got some kind of intellectual property that no one else knows about because the really good guys are so comfortable in their own understanding of the game understanding of their their philosophies they're already looking at the next level you know so copying is, is irrelevant uh, and and uh, i just think it's it's amazing and I, i'm actually i don't know what's going on in your, in your world i know uh, you know um in the rugby world at the moment, the amount of sharing and uh, networking that's happened. I have a coaches group. Um, like I'm out of the professional game, but I had a lot of good good contacts. Um, I'm still fascinated by it. Um, so I have a coaches group. I think there's 28 in it now. Um, 
fellas coaching Japan, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Russia, uh, France, England, Ireland, Wales, um, and we 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 have a Zoom call once a week, which is you know which is fine. But then um, outside of that, we're running loads of little projects and and uh, and initiatives, and we're having little group chats. So individuals who never met each other before or who are working in the same same area are, are hooking up and. It's the probably the only time ever the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere are being shut down at the same time. And, um, you know, the, the run of the mill, when you're in, in game mode, normal time, we don't have a lot of free time. And also, like in the old days, you might have stayed overnight after a game, went for a beer with the opposition coach, chatted about things. You know, now it's, it's basically, you know, recovery, meal, on a plane, home. Um, and you just don't get a chance to, to mix. So um, that's been brilliant. I'm sorry, I've been talking with a few GA coaches. Yeah. And there's very little of that, you know, and there's very little sharing. I just think it's something that that they need to look at because the reality is, you know, uh, even if we even if we don't um, give away anything, just actually building connections um, and being being able to be there for other people because coaching is a very difficult uh, career. It's very very volatile, very unsta- unstable. Um, so from from a networking point of view, obviously for future employment, it's good to know people, yeah. but um, also just to be able to go, look, I'm struggling with this player. Um, you know, what have you done in a situation like that? And, and and just come up with a better plan. So when this is over, we go back as better coaches or we go back with a better understanding of the game. So um, from that point of view, I, I think, like I said, going back to Gatland, uh, yeah, he, he, he was kind enough to, to take me under his wing to a certain extent. And what I love about Warren is... Um, the simplicity of his of his methods. Um, so I think simple is new clever, you know. Um, and he has a, a way of doing things. Uh, he keeps a real high consistency of the people he works with. So effectively, the people he's worked with in Wales and Was um, are the same people. Uh, and also in the lines, he brings some of those people together. So he's had ten years working with with the same uh, support staff, and you know that, that's absolutely massive in terms of trust, confidence. And just understanding of how everybody works. Um, and again, that's probably why he's been so successful in, in, in Wales and why the Lions are going to use him a third time because um, he gets it, you know, and he gets it and he doesn't try and, I suppose, overcomplicate it. Um, and, you know, I look, I look at, you know, I look at uh, Alex Ferguson and, and people like that. Generally, if you get a chance to, to stay, you know, six, seven years, um, you'll, you'll, turn around any organization i think if you've got the right right attitude yeah it's, it's really interesting i suppose if you understand things well enough that you can explain it in a very very simplistic manner it means you actually you're you're an expert in that area and like i've heard you before reference that a novice coach wouldn't be able to go into a setup like warren gatlin could and just be very simplistic in their approach and say well we need to get them fit we need to get them together and we need a bit of support but I suppose when you get to that level, you can do that. And, and like you referenced Alex Ferguson, he didn't have to say much because he had the players driving things, you know, from the front as well. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, um, even Eddie Jones, who I think has already reinvented himself six or seven times, he's able to declutter all that brilliant um, thought and ideas and give the players a very simple game plan and empower them to implement it. So, I'll give an example. Um, so, like, he's an absolute genius. But, like, if you, I don't know if you're watching England. When England play, um, before they go into the dressing room at half time, they have a huddle on the field. Okay. And then the defensive leader, um, the attack leader, and the captain will sum up what they feel has been the, half to- or the first half. When they go into the dressing room, they get three minutes to hydrate and check in with medical, etc. Eddie will talk to those three guys. Okay. They will give feedback to him about kind of what they said, how they see it. Um, obviously, if it's, if it's completely polar opposite to what he sees, he would challenge them and explain to them, you know, why, they're, why he sees it a different way. Um, but he makes sure, in general, that the message he gives at halftime are, are pretty aligned to their own summation of the game. Um, and again, it's just reinforcement, you know, reinforcement and, and trying to create better leadership. I, I listened to a podcast with George Ford and, you know, there's a, there's a, they, have a, they have a fear that the English team are too reliant on George Ford and Owen Farrell. So Eddie's working with them now for meetings, them not to open their, mouth, their mouths. 
So other people have to step up. Just little small things that, yeah. again, is common sense. But sometimes we go, well, Owen Farrell is the best captain. Uh, he's the best understanding of the game. Why don't we just let him take take control of every meeting? Yeah, that's fine. But what happens if George, if, if Owen Farrell gets injured in a World Cup final or whatever? So, um, again, it's just having that you know, trusted lieutenants or, uh, from a tactical point of view and obviously from a culture point of view. I love the cultural architect um, you know, terminology or... or, or uh, idea that basically you have those five or six people in the dressing room who are just actually making sure things are done properly. Yeah, it's interesting because people always think that like there's these keys to success or, or secret formula, but there's not in some ways. There's a, there's a whole load, a multitude of tiny little things like that, like you've said. And you often hear those things. You pick up those things from other coaches and from listening and from reading. And then you think, okay, well, actually, let's, can we implement this in, that in my program? And that goes back to the sharing again, doesn't it? Just being open and yeah. listening. And like it's unbelievable at the moment. I, 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 like there's so many webinars. I mean, I could do 10, 10 hours a week of webinars. And, and, you know, I've got some, I suppose, coach that I'm mentoring. And they're mad for information. Absolutely. They, they're devouring everything. They're, they're, you know, um, and it's great. It's absolutely brilliant. The challenge is, or, or um, is that it doesn't become too muddled for them, you know. Um, so I would say, absolutely, you know, watch, listen, learn, uh, read about everything you can. But at some stage, just pull away again and actually write down, you know, your philosophy. And it's just that little, there's one or two little nuggets or confirmations or or to pose a question that that will make you better. But the reality is, if you watch a webinar with Stuart Lancaster this morning for an hour, Eddie Jones this afternoon, uh, Wayne Smith tomorrow morning, and Warren Gatland, you know, um, they're all brilliant, but they all have their own way of doing things, and yeah. you have to be yourself as well. You have to be authentic, but uh, and that's 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 the challenge. But I mean, yeah, there's lots of little things you can just pick up on that you might use in a year's time or a week's time that will just help your players, I suppose, prepare better. Yeah, it's it's. I think this. As you say, the sharing is really important because it probably it allows you to get to know yourself as a coach and you, you build your own kind of character. Um, but then also you, you need to like implement it. You need to put it in, in place in a practical sense. Just like touching on the sharing thing before we go over to Joe uh, about some of the high performance stuff and the business stuff. I mean, I got to know you back when I was playing with Wexford, the Wexford senior football team in the, in the Matty Ford years, as we call it. It might have been 2007 or 2006, maybe sometime around then. Yeah. And yeah, so like you were this Leinster player in rugby, but yet you were willing to come into a GA team, a Wexford team who we hadn't quite made it. We were looking to like break through that barrier. And then fast forward years later, and when myself and the two lads were involved in the management of the, the London GA team, once again, you were head coach of Dragons, but yet you were willing to come in to the London boys, I think on two different occasions, and chat to them and, and advise them. And, and even bring it up to the current period where you're in our uh, Daily Sports Science WhatsApp group and you're giving out information and little tips. I mean, you, you've always taken that approach of you, you're wanting to help people, aren't you? Yeah, well, look, I've been very lucky. So I'll give you... Um, well, first of all, I love sport, right? Um, and for me to be allowed into a dressing room in any sport and to be part of, of, of trying to help a team achieve something is, is, is a privilege. So, um, and I probably like the underdog as well um, <laughs> because I, I've always been an underdog myself. But the, yeah, the, the, the sharing and the, um, and the sports thing, I think, is just... It's just basically a love of of, of, of sport, and um, I mean, I think as well. Sorry, when I got that job in France, so I basically applied for a job in France as a defense coach. I never coached defense in, in, in my life, um, and I was underqualified to do it. But I obviously built my system how I'd like to defend. It's not rocket science, in fairness. That I had good experience and worked under some good coaches, so I built a system that I felt was 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 the right system for the team in terms of where they were at. So I did analysis of, of kind of their strengths and weaknesses and the level they're playing at and referees, etc. Um, but the, I think the, what well, one of for me was, I said to the director of rugby, I said, if you give me this job, um, I'm going to fly to New Zealand for five weeks out of my own pockets and I'm going to go and meet defence coaches and 
um, and learn from them and not, not change my system, but make sure that I understand how to build it, um, what, how to fix it when it breaks, which is most important, um, and at what stage I can start to, to progress it, you know, because you've got to put the foundations in first. So I think that won it for me. And then the problem was I had to find people in New Zealand who let me in. Um, and a guy called Jamie Joseph was coaching the Otago Highlanders. He's now a Japanese coach. He actually was asked to go for the all-back job. Didn't go for it. Probably would have got it because um, he wanted to stay loyal to Japan. He was coaching the Otago Highlanders. My club coach in Clontarf was a guy called Brent Pope. Um, or had been. He, he was, uh, and very good to me as well. So Popey, I rang Popey and said, look, at in fairness, Gatlin would have as well. But I rang Popey first and I said, look, can you hook me up? I need to get to New Zealand. Um, I need to go to Super Rugby teams. And he said, look, no problem. I ring Jamie. So um, I went down to Otago and basically... Jamie said, you can stay for a week, but then we're going to uh, Argentina on tour. So obviously you can't come there. So that was fine. So I had a week with him and it was great and his coaches. And then he said, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I've got four weeks. I fly out of Auckland in four weeks. So I kind of need to get somewhere else. He goes, hang on, go to the Crusaders. So he rang Todd Blackadder. He took me for a week. Then he rang the Hurricanes coach, Chris Boyd. He took me for a week. Then they rang the Chiefs coach. So basically, I had, and then I went to the Blues. So in five weeks, I got to see the five New Zealand franchises. Now, I guarantee you, um, if I had went to England, you know, I, I would have gone into one or two clubs, but I wouldn't have got that access. I mean, like I was in coaches' meetings. I was in one-on-ones with players. I was in debriefs. And not just after they won, when they lost as well. Uh, and... Um, I just left that experience of going back saying, I've just worked with some of the, sorry, I've just observed some of the best players and coaches in the world. And, you know, someone put me up in their house. Um, just good people who didn't get carried away themselves, didn't think they were, you know, reinventing the wheel um, and were willing to share. So I said, well, that's, you know, I've been lucky enough to receive that. Um, I got to give it back. So, like, in Grenoble, we would have hosted coaches from anywhere. I mean, uh, you know, we had Russian German, uh, you know, Polish, loads of Irish, Welsh, English, Scots. So, and same in the Dragons, and, and same when I'm asked to go somewhere, if I can, I, I will, um, because I think that's that's the gift you have is is to is to share something. I mean, we're doing something um, that so many people like to do, and um, you know, looks in, in most cases we're getting paid for it, or some cases we're getting paid for, it. and um, you know, to to share and give back. And again, I I, don't, I think I've I've found. I've found out and improved from having people in my environment or our environment and, and just chatting, even if they're only coaching, you know, at what's perceived to be a lower level. Um, some of them have great ideas that maybe we don't think about because we were afraid to, to be too creative, you know? So, um, yeah, that's kind of the background to that. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And just getting those experiences going into other clubs and environments and high performance units, I, I think you, you learn an awful lot. Just before we go off to Joe, because he might delve into that a little bit, um, just remember all, all our listeners, head over to dailysportscience.com. Uh, there's some great content going up there now. Uh, there's a few offers as well for new members. I've got Sean Cavanaugh up here behind my left shoulder, who's my accountant. So um, he's making sure that everybody go, logs onto the website and, and, and has a look at a few of the options there. Joe, you're going to... Bernard, Joe actually is a business studies uh, teacher. Okay. on his day job <laughs> he's, he's going to grill you with with exam questions on your your right. business experience right. i might end up grilling him go on <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming on bernard uh bernard you, you talked there about uh, you know visiting high performance sports teams but uh I, obviously you've got a degree in business studies uh, as well uh, and i know that in the past you've you've talked about you know visiting businesses i think you visited dyson and also Toyota. Um, I'm sure you've asked this question a few times, but what, what aspects of kind of businesses or those businesses can, can you take or have you taken into the sports world? And, and also on that as well, are there any aspects of business or kind of corporations that you wouldn't dream of bringing into the sports world? Yeah, look, I think, um, uh, so I went back into the MSC in um, sports and exercise management in 2010. So when I retired, I, I wrote a book and um, I had a year where uh, I was waiting to go to France the, for the following year. So I, I went back and did an MSc and said, uh, I did my thesis on the correlation between high performance behaviors in sport and business. So that's kind of what I suppose led me to 
to go into Rolex and Dyson and, and, and Toyota. Um, and just like I did in, 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 um, in Wigan Warriors and Manchester United, um, I went to Carlton uh, AFL, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I tried to Melbourne Storm as well, uh, Rugby League. So yeah, I was trying to find out uh, from a, I suppose, personal point of view, even though it was for a thesis was, you know, what were the common uh, behaviors and, and you know why are these co companies successful in, in different across different sectors of business and sport um, and do they have do they have similar principles and they, and, and, and they do you know they all have a very strong strong culture and culture is thrown around all the time um, and it, it is absolutely important but I think they also have very good systems you know very good systems very good um, ability to hire and fire the best hire and fire good and bad talent um, and um, Good, very good at developing talent as well, um, and they're all, they're all very different. So, I mean, Toyota. If you work for Toyota, Japanese for instance, probably unique to them, but they, you know, they they take massive pride in being a Toyota man all their life, you know. So, or Toyota woman. So, if they can get in there at eighteen, they want to stay there at sixty-five, and and they will wear that badge, you know, uh, out socially with with absolute pride, and, and you know, and they might repeat the same task on a conveyor belt where. Uh, for 30 years but they will do it to the best of their ability I mean that's for me that's phenomenal and obviously what I enjoyed with them was the, the fine tuning of the process and, and, and making it quicker making it better um, making sure you know it's it's as efficient as possible Rolex was was, was different I mean they're they take so long uh, but so much pride in building something that's going to pass from generation to generation you know so um, there's a real I suppose uh, art to that and then Dyson was more around everybody had the, the right to be creative and come up with ideas. So there was a real kind of, um, it's probably a softer culture, you know, in terms of uh, let's, someone has an idea, let's everybody stop, let's go in and let's talk about it. And you don't have to be an engineer. But uh, again, what I, what, sorry, my point would be that all these companies and businesses have different ways of, of doing it, but their DNA is very strong. Their DNA is very strong in whatever the vision and mission was. And, the majority of people are aligned to that. Now, look at, unfortunately, in every um, in every organisation, there's people who don't buy into that and, and are are sappers or you know have negative energy or or whatever or, or wet wood for the fire. But um, there is the majority of them are very much aligned to to the mission. So um, I I think there's a lot of correlation between that, and I think again, and I'm not like I love culture and culture is absolutely massive um, but unfortunately at the moment I think there's coaches and managers who think get your culture right everything will be perfect and I know people are going to like this is uh, I had an argument not, sorry I had, a, I had an interchange with someone on another coach group yesterday who didn't believe this um, but I've been there like uh, in Grenoble uh, sorry in the Dragons we actually changed the culture massively Um from where it started at, it's not what it's not the, it wasn't the best culture in the world, but it changed massively, but didn't give us that instant gratification of wins. Right, you need other things to be uh, at elite's level. You need other things to be rock solid as well. So it's your it's your S and C, um, it's your ability, it's your medical department, um, it's your game plan, um, it's your skill set, it's your it's your physical ability to to be big and strong enough to handle opposition. It's your mental side. Um, you know, so it's 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 your development pathway. So those things take um, take a while and take money. So um, you know, again, like you do need a lot of things to to work or to be um, aligned. Uh, but when you get it right, you can have you can have unbelievable success. Um, I think you mentioned the word sappers there, and you know, we we all have come across these people either in organisations or in sports teams, and you know, they're the complainers. They, they, they're very negative. Uh, those, those types of people that you've come across, can, can you change those people or, or do you just get rid of them? What's your kind of philosophy with that? I think the problem with, um, with contracts is you can't change them too quickly. Um, and uh, so you have, and first, sorry, I think the first thing you need to do is try and change them. Um, and that's to sell a vision to them. That's to explain how important their behaviours are. Um, how they're portraying themselves, how other people see them. Um, and I've had some good success with that. You know, I've had some people who've, who've completely gone 360. Um, 
and then I have others who, who just can't get it. Um, and you know, at, at some stage, then you, you probably have to have to cut them loose. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, it was a great thing. I, I listened to um, one of the All Blacks coaches a couple of months ago, and you know, people speak about the All Blacks culture, and, and it's very strong or has become very strong, etc. Um, but he said we are so lucky in international rugby. It's a one match gig, right? So effectively. You know, if someone comes into all back camp on a Sunday night and they're playing Australia Saturday, um, it's really important that they, I suppose, commit to the All Blacks culture for that week, right? Because if they don't, the following week when they play South Africa, they can just not pick him in the team and they're gone out of camp. Whereas in a club environment, um, a guy could have a year on his contract or two years on his contract. So you, it's very difficult to be as ruthless because um, you mightn't have someone else in that position. Um, and so the guy knows he might play again quite quickly. So that's just a, an interesting one, and probably an intercounty level <clears throat> to a certain extent. You know, you, you can drop a, an underperforming, highly talented player out of the team um, or out of the squad. And I know there's, there's, there's obviously issues around that as well in terms of you know upsetting that Picard. But um, at, at club level and in soccer, contracts are, are make the situation much more difficult. Um, but yeah, I think. I would always try and change the person first and you're trying to create a connection with them and try to understand why they're behaving this way. I mean, um, I spoke to a fellow called John Afoa, uh, who's playing for Bristol, uh, ex-All Black this week, and he said they brought something in as a player group in Bristol um, and they call it the attitude tank. So basically, it's like an oxygen tank um, is the analogy, but <clears throat> they will basically say to somebody, hey, attitude tank, if someone is, if, if someone is actually sapping, and it's just, it's an easier way of saying, don't be sapping. But, um, and again, what they do is they actually have a, a review every six weeks with each player. And the leadership group will sit in on that with the coaches. And effectively, um, they will measure and feedback to each player traffic light system under leadership, uh, community, and attitude tank. So, but the player has to come in with his own um, his own observation of, of what he is at. So he'd put up his PowerPoint and he'd have, you know, green for leadership uh, and he might have green for attitude and the coaches and players then was, or the leadership group might say to him, well, actually, you know, we had you down as a, a, as a red. And it creates that, that discussion and it's, it can be quite confrontational because actually they call it the bull ring. So effectively, the, uh, but this stage, the, the bulls are, are kind of on the outside which is the coaches and leadership group, and in the middle is the is the player. So you need to be ready to to, to to fight your case. But you know yourself, you can only fight your case if you have the evidence to to back it up. So I just think it's a really good way without having massive. Uh, and it particularly, it seems in Bristol, the players are are into it now, and they're just a tank attitude tank. You know what I mean? Just when someone is, is just being a bit negative, so it's not, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, I think those. Um... I think you helped Kieran with those individual action plans that uh, Kieran brought in with with London. Yeah. I think they were, they were very useful. Where where we sat down with each individual player, and we had chats with them, we had discussions with them about their physical targets, psychological targets, and so on. I think those things those things help a lot as well because they get the players focused. Yeah. I think you brought that in with with London, Kieran, didn't you? Yeah. So it was funny because actually we were looking to bring it in with London GA. Uh, Ross and the lads, you know, and Chris Ramsey down in QPR uh, Academy were bringing it in in QPR. And then obviously Bernard, you had brought it in with Dragon. So and we were kind of, we somehow okay. managed to come together at one time. But tell us a little bit about that, actually, because we found them personally quite interesting and, and very worthwhile doing, you know. So each player knew exactly where they stood, what they needed to improve on, what their super strength was. And it was a nice kind of facilitation between the backroom team and the players also. Yeah, I, I just think it's a brilliant, uh, I suppose, way of, of creating better discussion and better understanding from a coaching point of view of where the player is coming from and from a player's point of view about where the coaches see your, your strengths and weaknesses and what you've got to work on. And, and, um, and it should be theirs. Like it's, it's about taking ownership. Like I, I say to a lot of players, um, Effectively, they're CEOs of their own business. You know, they're one-man business. So, so many blame the coach, the physio, 
uh, nutritionist, uh, travel, whatever. The reality is, if you if you see yourself as CEO of your own business, for sure, you know you need a good environment around you to uh, to help you. But the reality is, so much of it is is on me as CEO. You know, so if I need a massage, you know, I need to get a massage. If I need extra physio, I need to get extra physio. Um, and I think that mindset change of seeing yourself as a CEO of, of your own business as an athlete is is massive. And you know, good CEOs get good people to help them. So. You know, your board might be your, your skills coach, your SSE coach, um, and it's having that really good relationship with them and understanding of where you're at. Um, and that's, that's a skill, if they can develop that, that's a skill they can transfer into corporate world afterwards. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who are caught in the corporate level who don't understand that either. Um, but I just think if you're having a one-on-one with a player or a, or a coach's uh, meeting with a player, it changes the whole mindset from... It's a review, right? And um, and it's about us telling you what's not going well, which often happens, or what you need to work on. Whereas if I come into that meeting with my own individual development plan, and I already understand kind of what was said the last time, I understand more about myself, I understand what's going into me being a better player, um, which is what all athletes want to be, or a better athlete, um, and it's tactical, technical, social, psychological, and you have a you have a, a clear i suppose plan that's agreed upon it's not look at here's your idp and um, go off i mean they're they're part of the whole process i, I just think it, it can you know it, it can help players get better on a regular basis and like some of the big corporations are doing it now you know google or uh, um are doing it linkedin are doing it um where the, the days of the of the end of year review um you know with your manager i mean they, they should be gone you know it should be lots of small small informal chats um, regularly around, around an agreed set of, uh, um, of, of ways forward. Yeah. It's interesting because you mentioned like really high performing corporate businesses like Google and, and LinkedIn are now using it because the way we approached it originally with London GA was that we obviously didn't have the highest quality players. We didn't have the facilities. Uh, we were actually trading on a rugby pitch most of the season. We didn't have the funding. So in some ways, we were a bit like you with the Dragons. So we thought that, okay, well, what can we control? We can, can control getting the absolute best out of every single player in terms of technical, tactical, physical, psychosocial. So you're trying to wring out every last tiny little bit of ability and, and talent. Do you feel that it's, it's most appropriate with those kind of uh, more probably, challenging setups? Yeah. or? No, it's it's obviously it's 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 um it's fundamental for us for the for the teams without the resources because uh, it's the only chance you have. Um, but again, and uh, you know, and I, I, I've I've been chatting to some some guys in, in the best team, so obviously I'm close to Leinster still. Um, and I'm saying this to my coaches group that okay, you know, we're in lockdown. There's maybe a, a, I suppose it's easy to maybe feel sorry for yourself and and feel helpless. Um, so it's really important that we're we're working to get better, but the problem is, or, or the challenge is, the best are doing the same thing. So, um, so like Leinster are working with the Crusaders at the moment. So they basically they've connected with the Crusaders. So the top team in the Southern Hemisphere is Crusaders. The top team in <laughs> Europe, uh, argumentatively, is Leinster, um, and their coaches have all have all basically decided or agreed to work together. So the Crusaders are analysing Leinster at the moment. Leinster analyzes the Crusaders. So again, you very rarely, as a coach, get a chance to see what other teams see in you. You see it based on how they target you, but you don't see what they saw and why. Um, I know the, the, the winning co- the winning team in Japan, um, uh, the Steelers, co- co- uh, Kobayashi Steelers, who are coached by Wayne Smith, they're working with Scotland at the moment. So they've won the Japanese league, and they haven't said, "Okay, let's get a club team in England." They've said, "Let's get international team." And they're doing the same thing, and there's there's all kinds of um, sharing and counter analysis and, and uh, etc. So again, you know, London Dragons IDPs absolutely. Unfortunately, Dublin um, and Saracens are doing the same thing. You know what I mean? So if you're not doing it, you're you're actually falling further behind. The yeah. challenge is, Kieran, for 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 you to you or us or Joe to find something that's going to help us catch up. 
above and beyond. Above and beyond. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Don't tell them about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't put it out there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just interested. I mean, the, we didn't tell you, but the real reason we brought you on was uh, we, I, I read that Refensive re, have a $6 billion uh, revenue stream coming in every year. So obviously we, we're, we're getting them in as sponsors of our, of our show, the podcast. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm just interested because I saw, I, I heard you speak before about in the corporate world, just before we head over to Ross, about the, you like the, the measurable targets that you have in that corporate world. So you have to hit X amount of sales or people or whatever. But then on the other hand, in the sporting world, as you mentioned, alluded to, there was you know, a lot about the soft skills and the environment and the culture. Like, is there, can they go hand in hand together? Is it best if the soft skills and, and those measurable targets are together? Or is there, can there ever be a bit of a conflict between the two? Look, I think the problem in sales, so I'm in sales. Um, the problem is you can have mavericks in sales who don't give a F about the team but they can be really good yeah. at, at hitting their numbers um, and obviously bringing that revenue in. Now I would say, I would say uh, long-term, long-term that'll come back to bite the company on, on the ass because maybe they're overly aggressive with clients or um, there's that lack of teamwork, you know, so they, they can cut people out of deals. They can, um, you know, maybe be overly aggressive, etc. but they are, they are high performers, but they are very much working in silo and that's, that's changing really. I mean, uh, most organizations now need people who, who, who embrace teamwork and bring a good team of people together to help deliver, you know, obviously the sale, but also, you know, a success for the client as well. Um, so, yeah, for me, I think, like, coming from a coaching world where, you know, our, our, I suppose our lives are built around targets, whether that's targets in terms of improving your players in terms of their KPIs or targets in terms of improving your stats in defense or targets in terms of winning games, etc. Um, you know, I like that clarity around how I'm performing. And obviously the softer stuff is harder to it's harder to measure, but you can measure it. You know, you can measure it in terms of getting feedback and and uh, and you I would expect my team to to hold me to account around around that. And I and I I'm willing to hold people to account around that as well if I feel they're not they're not playing their role in terms of the the team the team aspect of it. Um but yeah, like so, I've got a set amount of, of, of targets in terms of sales retention, um, cold calling, um, in terms of uh, contacts with my activity every day, um, and you know I like to see at the end of the day, end of the week, end of the month, you know where I am, and so from that point of view, I do I do get uh, I do enjoy and, and find a lot of correlation between you know, the coaching, sporting side of it and, and the corporate side of it. And we're in a massive, like I've got my, I, I'm looking after, I think, 14.4 uh, million worth of revenue every year in, in Ireland. So um, it's like, you need to be on the money because uh, even though we're a 6 billion pound company, um, it's, uh, it's still important. I look after my patch really well and, and uh, I drive, drive success there. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because, you see, Bernard, Ross is my boss in QPR. So this, oh, yeah. is, part, this is part of my appraisal, <laughs> this, <laughs> this podcast. But, but Ross, you were going to chat about that kind of multidisciplinary team work and bringing people together and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cheers, Kiers. And Bernard, thanks very much for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, speaking words of wisdom that we're taking away already. Obviously, you've mentioned a lot about the, the MDT and having good support staff. But what do, you, what do you really look for? Like in my trade, so sports scientist, head of performance, whatever role it is, what specific skills are you looking for um, for that person to come in and do that role? I think they've got a, I think the sports scientists are the hardest working. Sports scientists and physio, physios are probably the hardest working uh, members or, or sectors of sports staff I, I've seen. Um, the good ones are anyway. Um, so you got to be hard working, got to be passionate, um, have to be organized, you know, detailed, um, and being able to put together a strategy really, and then deliver the strategy, but be willing sometimes to, to, I suppose, maneuver, you know, based on circumstances, you know, so COVID is a perfect example. Um, you know, it's completely unknown to it's the first pandemic, I think, in a you know, century, um, everybody's finding their feet on it and, and um, just trying to make common sense decisions based around good fundamentals, um, but being able to communicate that to your head coach. So if I'm head coach or, or manager, um, what I like is, 
have you ever heard of a, team, a principle called red teaming? Okay, no. so red teaming is a, is a management theory. It came from the military in, a, in the US where effectively if you've got 10 people in the room agreeing on something, um, it's the wrong, so it's, it, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. So as a, as a leader or a manager, um, to ask difficult questions and to, 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 to really push and probe sometimes, not all the time. Look, if you need something so quickly, obviously you've got to go, but stay in pre-season or in a time like this um, to just basically tap into the experts we have in our team. Um, and, you know, if you came to me and said, look, I think for the next four weeks, this is the strategy. Well, just to really probe there, even though, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to back you anyway. It's, it's to be able for you to be able to, um, I suppose, have the understanding and have it taught it true enough to be able to convince me. Because I think if you can convince the head coach um, and, and the other coaches, well, then when the players question it, um, it's going to be easy for you. Because I think that's the, what I, what I think players need is certainty. You know, and and um, real conviction from <clears throat> coaches, S and C, etc. This is the right way forward for us. It doesn't always have to be the exact same. It doesn't have to be. Chelsea are doing something. Fair play to them. They're building their strategy based on what they have um, in in their in their in their dressing room or where they're at in their stage. Um, but again, it's 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 actually the guy called Charlie um, uh, Charlie Higgins. I think his name is the Leinster performance uh, head of performance. He did, um, he did something, or I spoke to him recently, and he said if he had his time again, the two things he would do as an S&C coach would be public speaking, a course of public speaking, and a course in sales. And I think that's massive. So, you know, I would want you or an SNC, my S&C coach, if he stood up in front of a group of players, or she stood up in front of a group of players, uh, to be really confident in terms of their, their theory, um, be really confident in terms of the ability to deliver and to be able to sell it, you know. And uh, that's, that's I'm asking for a lot. I'm asking for someone to be technically really good, really organized, hardworking, uh, good public speaker, and being able to uh, sell. So yeah. No, that's great stuff. And that's probably something that probably gets missed in the, the education system a yeah. little bit. And until you go and work under good coaches like yourself, you probably don't get probed on that. So it's a bit of a shock when, when it comes first, first time round. I think. In fairness, and I bet you, if you do an SSC degree in two years' time, there'll be no sales or no public speaking in it. Um, <laughs> but, and I, I don't even, sorry, it's not just for s and it's for, it's a, it, it's a school, uh, for teaching, for, say, for, for anything. To be able to get up in front of a, a group of people and, and say, Look, this is what I believe um, is is important, and you know I, I really think we should go down this route um, and be able then to, to discuss it and problem solve. But um, yeah, so I, I think SSCs are are absolutely crucial, um, and I do think you need to have an all rounded skill set. And obviously, you know you need to have some certain super strengths. So if, I've seen really good SSC coaches who are brilliant at selling, maybe not as good at the at the, the practical or the, the theory and the, the organization. But it can have an influence over over a group, so um, you don't have to be world class in all of those. But they would be the fundamentals, I would say, um, that you'd have to be, uh, you know, very strong in a couple of them at least, and working towards getting becoming world class in the others. For sure, and that probably leads into the individual plans as well. So, uh, have you any experience and um, around staff doing that? Because I think the staff sometimes get lost in that whole, you know, PDP and IAP stuff. Any experience around that in terms of making the strengths and weaknesses within staff? Oh yeah, I think if you're doing it for the players only, you're you're a hypocrite. You know, uh, yeah. you need to have one yourself <laughs> first of all, um, and all your staff should have one and be willing to be willing to share it. You know, uh, share it as, as coaches. Um, I think it's a really good thing I've done before is where um, everybody in the organization um, needs to have a, a three page minimum PowerPoint ready, okay, about themselves. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything. It could be three pictures, it could be three words, um, it could be 20 pages if you want, uh, it could be movies. It's up to you to have it. And, I, and players would have that, and coaches and staff, and anyone involved would have that at the start of the year. Give it to the video analyst. And, um, we would, um, he'd have it on his, uh, on his laptop and throughout the year we'd get through everybody. Um, and effectively what we'd use is, we'd use that wheel of fortune. So basically it's a spinning wheel, everybody's name is on it. Um, and you know, a Tuesday afternoon in December, um, at the head coach, I'd say, okay, um, right, let's do, let's do two, right? Um, two, two people and pick out two people, 
randomly uh, they go up and they basically talk about themselves and their background and their, their story and their journey. And I've had, I've had rooms crying. You know, with, I've had, uh, I've found out things about people that I have absolutely no idea and I would always try and connect. It, it, it's because I see other people sharing, you know, and um, they, want to, they want to connect with people. Uh, so I would say it's gone off your IDP thing, but um, yeah, I think everybody in a team or organization should be willing to show vulnerability if they if it's in them. And don't like it's not false. I mean, if if, if you're if you don't have anything that is really driving you or that that impacted you, whatever, you just say, look, this is me. This is where I was born. This is my family, um, and this is my goal or whatever, uh, uh, and that's fine. But I've seen, as I said, some really powerful stuff from that, and a stronger sense of connection. And then again, these IDPs. I mean, I should be so comfortable in my IDP you know, that it's on my screensaver or it's, um, you know, if someone asked, if, if my assistant coach said to me, if, if, when I'm having my, my re review with him or, or, or catch up with him, you know, I'd be able to say to him, look, take it out there, you know, are we giving you the support you need um, from, a, from a tactical point of view? Do you want me to connect you to uh, another coach um, and, and who can help? help you with that area or can I mentor you more on that or you know can I give can we do some challenges where you know we do some stuff that's not around the dragons or Grenoble um or is there is there some you know if you're struggling on leadership can I can I create a leadership um plan for you like so as a head coach you should pretty much know everybody's IDPs to some extent um or uh, be very much involved in it, and not just players it should be it should be staff as well that's a great answer. And I think sometimes you get so wrapped up in coaches, for the coach. I think it's a great answer because sometimes you get so caught up in trying to make the players better and yeah. even themselves forget to well, actually look at themselves. I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll, I'll give you a good one, right? So I've trans I've transitioned uh, in the last year. I'm in a coaching group um, for talking about transitioning, all right? So it's about transitioning for coaches. Um, and all all the coaches are worried about is the players and the athletes. Um, lack of work on terms of preparing themselves for life after sport, right? And I keep trying to say, lads, yeah, uh, listen, it's absolutely brilliant, right? That you guys are worried about your athletes. But what are you doing about yourself? Like, what what's your plan for 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 life if if uh, if you get sacked on uh, in June? Um, what what could you do next? Because I know a lot of coaches. I'm not trying to be um, negative here, but I know coaches who aren't really enjoying coaching in professional in the professional world but they were professional players became professional coaches they're 44 45 they've no other skill set that's formal they've, they've loads of skills but they don't see why anybody would want to employ them um but yes they're so focused on and this is why they're good coaches they're so focused on preparing their players helping the players um they don't put any time into their own development or they sorry that's it they don't put any time into thinking about what else they could do. Um, and I, I noticed, so I, like, before I decided to go for, to take this job, I spoke to lots of companies. And when you tell them what, co when you tell them what your life experience is as a coach, um, they're absolutely so impressed. You know what I mean? And also, I would say, as a coach, you're far more employable than an ex-player, even though the ex-player has the profile or the recent profile. Um, it's a massive shock to their system to go into a, an office from eight to six. Um, whereas as coaches, you know, it's six to six to nine. You know what I mean? We, uh, and we've had, we're used to meetings. We're used to uh, deadlines. We're used to having to fulfill certain tasks on a regular basis. Um, so I, I think coaches, you know, I know Google, uh, Google are definitely into, into the idea of, of bringing people who are really strong in coaching in, um, as they're called no more lookalikes. So one in five can be left field. Um, and the experience coaches have and, and the skill set coaches have is something that's definitely transferable and actually needed. That's a really good answer. And I think it's important for coaches to, to think about the future and where they're going as well. Just bringing it back a little bit, Bernard, to like this whole adaptable side of the performance staff and the sports staff. Like specific scenarios that I come to mind is like, if, uh, have you been in a situation where a sports science SNC has a fairly extensive longer term plan or even a shorter term plan, three, four weeks, and it might come to a position where they want to bring off the players in terms of working them hard. But you as the coach feel that 
you know, obviously you've got the injury side to think about, but from a psychological perspective, no, I want to keep working them here. How does that, how do them negotiations take? And ultimately, you know, how do you kind of um, negotiate those in terms of communication? Yeah, I think by having data, to be honest. Um, so to understand, understand where you're at. In ter- well, obviously starting off with having a really well, I suppose, documented plan um, and something that's easy. I'm not very smart, so um, I, I need things that are visually um, simple to, to see. Um, so it's how it's presented to me in terms of, you know, wh- where the graph is going, um, up or down, um, and where where we are against that graph, you know. So um, I think that that needs to be discussed on a, on a regular basis. I mean, we would have always had a, a you know, a morning meeting and, a, and an evening wrap-up, um, and we would try and get as much data into both those as possible, or, or, or kind of identified metrics. Um, and again, we would have... Uh, had a, we would have measured all our drills and our, our, our drills have seemed the uh, d- drills a dirty word at the moment. All our blocks, right? Or, Practices. <laughs> yeah, all our parts of training. Um, and we would have known what they were going to give us in terms of physical output. Uh, so again, like, and, and it takes a while to do that, but then you shouldn't have any surprises in, in terms of, you know, if, you're, if your session was supposed to be X amount of, of high-speed meters, X amount of total meters, accelerations, decels, um, and you and you plan that properly, you know you shouldn't be far off uh, that afternoon. But it's trial and error, and and you know, but it's about having that review process or post mortem every day. I think is really important, and that that takes away that massive shock when when your SC coach comes into you three weeks later and goes, "Look, we've, we're way off where we need to be." And um, but again, as well, like I think you have to be flexible. I think um, you know, for me, so my heads of the department would have been. The rugby, the S and C, and the medical. Um, you know, we would have met every Wednesday, and um, we would have trashed it out together. You know, and uh, and also taken into the into the picture the the mindset of the players or the or the or the, the feeling in the dressing room as well. Uh, without going like just we totally react to that because if you if you react to that too much, um, you know, you'll always have a I think a soft soft dressing room or a dressing room where we're looking to do less. Um, but then there's other times where you need to say, look at lads, yeah, you know, you, we've come to a really difficult block, travel's been difficult, um, and have a chat with our, with our, with our senior players. So um, on a Monday morning, we would have, I would have always met senior players with heads of departments. And again, we would have always started with, how was last week for you? You know, and not, and then stay quiet and wait till they tell you. And not, don't start with Saturday. So this is a Monday morning. Try and go, get them back to the Monday. How was the Monday? How were the meetings? How was the review? How was the Tuesday? How was the Wednesday? Because if you go, if they've lost on Saturday, which we often did, you know, the temptation is the week was crap, right? But you could find that you could actually work out that the week actually was really good. You know what I mean? It was just we didn't perform or we didn't have the the, the tools to, to win. Um, but if you don't say, well, what about Monday? And how how did you find that meeting went? So we we also we measure meetings. So our analyst, um, our analyst takes notes in meetings, um, and sometimes he videos meetings to try and help the coaches um, be better in meetings. But more importantly, to take notes of what the coaches are saying, what the players are saying, and then obviously that's part of our chat on Monday morning. Well, yeah, well, you know, we said we were going to go after that area, and you said that was an option, but we didn't, we didn't do that. Why, you know, uh, um, but to try and. When you review stuff, try and not have it just based on the match. You know, try and get them to understand. And hopefully, ideal scenario, when you have really good weeks, you have really good performance Saturday. And then they, they realize, you know, just the process is important rather than actually... Like in France, in France, it was just, if you won, it was brilliant. And if you lost, it was crap. Um, uh, and that's not the case, you know. Um, sometimes you lose games, haven't prepared really well. And sometimes you win games, haven't prepared really badly. Um, but I think when you're having those those feedback sessions on a on a Monday morning, with your with your heads of department and your and your, play, and your senior players, senior player leadership group, um, it can't be just about the the result. It has to be around, the pro- and it's a great chance for for them to come back. So the reason I only have heads of department in there is because I want I want them to be able to tell me if there's a problem with a coach, or if there's a problem with one of your assistant coaches in terms of if the if there's a feeling in the player group that some guy's been hard or lazy or whatever, um, and it's up to us then as a group to talk about that. Now, obviously, we've got to protect 
our teams. But um, it's also good for, for us to be able to nip that in the bud before it becomes an issue. And I, that's the thing for me as well. I always say to players and coaches, um, it's far better for me to keep you informed about where you are in terms of my happiness with you or uh, Dan bluff and shake your hand every day and tell you you're going great. And then in April say, look, we're not going to renew you. You know, I didn't like this, that and the other. Um, so uh, I think that's important that there's a forum and it's not just the head coach and not just the senior players coming to me and I'm going to the head of the head of the department and then we're calling the player in that we're big and bold enough as a group to, to basically say, and also like for us to be able to say to them, okay, fine. The reason he's been hard is because you lads aren't tidying away the gym app. Like just, you know, you're, you're, you guys aren't, this is your role in this. And this is why he's getting frustrated. Or uh, so we chat about that together and we're, we're mature about it. Yeah, and I love your concept of post-mortem. I know you brought that into London with us as well, but constantly reviewing everything that you do. I think that from that, Bernard, I think that um, in professional football or soccer, um, called it, I think they're, they're a little bit behind in terms of allowing players to have a bit more of a voice. And I think it's more management-led, whereas the stuff in what you're saying in the rugby and the GA give really good insight to, to player ownership and a voice, and it, it can kind of bring that cohesion together. So that's, that's really interesting to uh, bring out. The last point from me, Bernard, just before I hand you back to Kiers, is... Um, there's a big emergence around psychology and you speak about it loads in terms of like, you know, the mental health, the psychological preparing of performance and, and the well-being. What's your experience in the last five, 10 years of more, let's say clinical experts coming into the game, um, into different sports and working with players and staff and, and where, where do you sit on that? How does it work? How does it best work for you in terms of giving the support to the players? I think it's really important. Um, I, I hired one in the Dragons, um, a sports psychologist. I think, I think that it's it's a, it's a tool that we need to tap into, and I, I think there's a stigma around it. Um, there's an old-fashioned stigma around some, but maybe in some dressing rooms is still seen as as um, as a weakness, which I think is is bullshit. Um, I think if you want to be the best possible athlete you, you can be, it's one of those areas that can help you be better um, and even you know I, I've seen guys who I thought were mentally tough and robust and resilient who went went to see somebody just to make sure that, that there was, wasn't anything extra they could do you know it wasn't any way better preparing um, the only thing I would say is I think it's important that it's not rammed down players throats um, so for me I like to have a guy in the environment uh, or, or lady in the environment, but it's up to the players to to reach out, you know. And it was really important that, for me that that the, the guy, it turned out to be a, a guy I had in the Dragons that he was at certain training sessions, he was around the group a lot, just also observing. So if a player came to him, um, he'd already seen kind of body language and picked up some tells. But um, and I never wanted to know. I, I is completely private between like if he hadn't if he never saw a player in the dragons um that was that was fine you know it was up to it was very much up to the players to, to tap into that but i do think a, in a in a high performance environment and you have the finance to do it i think it's a it's an area of support that that should be put on for the players but i wouldn't be massive on on on, on a sports psychologist presenting to the group a lot to be honest i think that's our job um as coaches um, and I think we can we can influence their thinking to a certain extent, or, or help help sell a, a, a mentality that we need to have as, as players. But I, I I do think from an individual point of view, um, it's a resource that people should should tap into. Um, just around the player ownership thing, um, like some rugby teams now, uh, and maybe like the, the players deciding on a, on a Thursday morning what the training session is that afternoon in terms of content. So again. Bristol, for an example, um, the leadership group will go to the coaches on a Thursday morning. They have a meeting first. They go to coaching on Thursday morning, and effectively, they, they, how they do the team session is it's, it's um, they have units which are scrum and line outs or back strikes, twenty minutes. So obviously, that's coach led because um, they're running through the menu. They're going to use that weekend, and then they have a, a skills wheel which is fifteen minutes. Okay, which is. Um, pretty standard practices, not drills, right? That they that they do regularly, um, and then they have three six-minute blocks. Okay, so the players, the leadership group, will 
tell the coaches what the content of those three six minute blocks are. So they'll do six minutes, 45 second rest, review, uh, post mortem as a group, six minutes, again rest, six minutes. And that's, and after that, then they do, do some uh, in IDPs, so individual development plans. Um, but again, it's that whole thing of they, they know what the game plan is for Saturday because they've been involved in that Monday, Tuesday. And on Thursday morning, they go, right, well, we need to do two kickoffs. We need to do three um, turnover plays, counterattack. Well, and they put it together. And then they tell the players, the leadership group tell the players what the session is. And effectively, on a Friday morning then, which is unusual, they have a 40-minute review of that with the coaches. So it goes back from player-led to coach-led. And then they go out, the players go out and do a walkthrough. Don't do a captain's run. Do a walkthrough and then they play. So... Um, a lot of coaches are afraid to give up that power. I think that's sure. the, the way the game is the way the game is going, and the way you're going to get more out of people is to empower them. Bernard, I I, I love that idea you put up on the the Daily Sports Science uh, WhatsApp group, where you as coaches then you you set little tactical challenges to your players. So you sent yeah. them some what was it? You sent them some video and then asked them questions about okay, well, what would you have done differently, or what did you do well? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is um, uh, we need to understand this. I'm not saying it was better than our day, but we used to watch full games. We actually, on a Six Nations weekend or Five Nations weekend, I'd sit down the TV and I'd watch Ireland Scotland when I was 13 or 14. So I understood, I understood, or tried to understand or watch the process from getting from your own goal line to the opposition goal line. Now, fellas, just watch three minutes highlight videos, right? And you don't see. It's like in your game, you don't see much defending or, or put send the guy one way in a, on a highlights video. You know, it's the it's the beating the man, it's the it's the shots and goal, etc. Um, in soccer and in rugby, it's it's the big tackles, it's the offloads, it's the tries. So again, you know, I, I try and send clips that aren't just sexy. You know, it's actually a boring exits. You know, um, and I don't say anything. I just well, I just say, well, look at lads. You know, what do you see? And it started off like really basic um, and I started off players messaging me with some really good stuff would say I don't want to put this on the group because I'll get slagged whatever um, but you know I would always encourage them to put it on the group and 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 now now we're getting some great stuff back stuff that I haven't seen or my coach haven't seen or ideas and uh, again it's uh, it, and it's on whatsapp like it's not on that fancy it's basically me cutting up a piece of footage making it uh, small enough that it goes on WhatsApp by reducing the quality and obviously not long either sometimes it's the maximum I'd say would be a minute and a half and actually getting them to and then sometimes what I do is at the end I wrap it all up and summarize and I put some graphics on it and I send it back to them again you know so they can see their ideas um, but yeah look you have to be imaginative and creative and um, like we're doing challenges now you know uh, tell, a jo- tell a story tell a joke challenge and um, juggling and things like that just to try and keep them occupied you know yeah yeah no it's a, it's a great idea we, we we've gone an hour and a quarter to be honest we could go another hour i'm like i'm i've taken i've taken so much i'm actually i'm really looking forward to like sitting down and listening and with my paper and pen and going through stuff because there's so many different things there and i love the way you've gone into different sports and different environments and picked up stuff we've a few just kind of quick one i mean we as, as i said we could cover another hour but we we better keep it quick and joe you might jump in with a few at, at different times here at the end as well um first one can you tell us just quickly what it was like playing and training every day with a player as tal- as outrageously talented as somebody like brian o'driscoll and gordon darcy but also were there any players who for instance might surprise us that it may not have been their talent, their natural talent, but some other little things that maybe got them to the top of the game. Um, I look at training with O'Driscoll and, and Darcy and Contaponi, um was just like phenomenal. I mean, I, you know, I call it piano pusher. I'm a piano pusher. They're piano players, you know, and uh, uh, I would never, I would never dream that I could do any stuff they did. But I had a role to do, uh, which is get my head down and, uh, yeah. and push and drive. Um, but yeah, it was amazing, and and you got better at training with them because again, you, you felt you felt always on edge, and I think that's a big part of the development is the stretch. You know, to be always a little bit, or not always, to be at certain times outside your comfort zone, and um, to get better. So um, that was that was phenomenal. I think the biggest thing for me, I probably saw, was bravery. 
you know, regularly, bravery and, and ability to deal with pain. Um, I think if you're going to spend 12, 13 years as a professional rugby player, um, you know, there's very rarely a day where you're not broken up. Um, but you got to just get through it a lot of time, you know. And uh, and the really the guys who had longevity, they had just as many injuries as the fellas who who um, who got let go or um, or retired because of injury. And so obviously just the, the acute injuries you can't do anything about. But um, I've seen a lot of players give up because they couldn't handle the pain um, and the relentlessness of being sore uh, and in fairness I, I, I back myself on that one um, like in 2009 2010 um, and I only remember it because my wife told me the other day like I would have most mornings come down the stairs on my bum because it took me that's how sore it was uh, um, and I and he was talking to Enda McNulty the other day because he was working with us in Leinster and um, he said the week of the Highland Cup semi-final we did a throne session on the Tuesday and he just couldn't believe I was going to play um, because I was like really fucked and uh, yeah. uh, like limping badly, broke up. But y- you know that you'll get through it on adrenaline, and and thankfully, by the end of the week, you're you're feeling a bit better. But it's just that it's just that relentlessness of yeah. of play, get broke up, be in pain till Thursday, Friday, feel a little bit better, play again, um, and that's that, that's 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 it. That's uh, not many people could do that. That's yeah. there's there's twenty five percent, thirty percent professional players who are there because they can push themselves uh, through stuff more than others. Yeah, but uh, another one from me, and I'll pass to Joe. Any players or teams that you particularly kind of relished coming up against? And, and I love Munster. I love Munster. Uh, uh, playing against them. Um, because it was basically mo- near, nearly always your competitor to play for Ireland. Um, and then it was red versus blue. Uh, and were the two biggest rivals. One of the biggest rivalries in... In, in, in European sport I think at one stage and uh, you know there was hatred among the fans there was hatred among the players while the game was on um, huge respect obviously afterwards and, but just they were great games I mean no one gave, a, gave an inch and uh, um, I enjoyed playing against them uh, Bernard just um, I know that GAA is your, uh, your first love uh, just, just a quick question who's your favourite GAA player and also uh, can Dublin be stopped um, I like Morris Fitzgerald. Uh, <laughs> giving away my age here, but uh, he, he just—he was just so graceful and and um, and, and talented. I liked, um, uh, yeah, like uh, Matty Ford was obviously very good um, for sure. To be honest with you, and not no one noticed, fella. My first and, and guy was Kevin O'Brien, who played corner forward for Baldy Glass. So my moments were Baldy Glass, so uh, they won an All Ireland Club Championship in maybe ninety. 95 or something anyway so I would have went to Coke Park on Paddy's Day for that and um, I'm everything's from Carlo but I played on my GA in Wicklow so I would have followed Wicklow and he was outstanding I mean he, he could play for any county in Ireland so he would have been the first guy and then it was Marcus Fitzgerald and then um, you know Matty Ford so uh, three three forwards really which is uh, surprising Brilliant <laughs> and what about Dublin? Uh, Dublin look at I think Can they be stopped? <clears throat> I think Kerry gave them an unbelievable run last year, um, probably closer than, than I expected. Um, who knows? Who knows? You know, with the transition from from Jim, um, I was doing a bit of Cork last year. I think Cork have a load of potential, um, and uh, which may be a little bit naive defensively, but unbelievable athletes, um, unbelievable go- or scoring potential as well. Like a lot of real free free flowing uh, scores. And I think they have a lot well managed um, uh, by Ronan, um, and he's brought in you know he's brought in some people into his backroom staff who, who maybe can make the tackle better, and then changes S and C as well. So I think Cork could be dark horses, maybe not to win it, but definitely to be a top four team. Um, and I'm, I can't wait to see how Kerry look at can't wait to see how Kerry come back. In theory, Kerry would be better next year, um, and, uh, and maybe Dublin won't be as good. Who knows? Yeah, and Bernard. Favorite grounds or favorite countries uh, or city Park. to play? Uh, Crow Park was F- yeah. Paris for me, Stade de France. Um, I mean, the noise there. Um, I played my first Six Nations game there away, wow. um, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think it's 80,000. And then Crow Park, like, uh, I was looking up to play in Crow Park for Ireland and, and Leinster. And obviously, with my GA roots, you know, it was just 
it's a phenomenal stadium. Uh, I would love to play in Wembley. Ireland played in Wembley when Wales were building the Millennium, mm. and um, again, it's an iconic stadium, you know. Uh, but I, I didn't make the team. But uh, they're the kind of ones, you know, Old Trafford because I'm a United fan, but I never got to play there. But as in terms of where I played, probably the Millennium Stadium, Stade de France, and uh, Co Park would be the top three. Brilliant. Okay, last last question before we just ask about what what your next steps are. Um, what about the feeling of playing for your country and the feeling of playing for Ireland and what that meant to you as, as a young lad com, coming up from, from Tolo? Yeah, it was unbelievable. So I got my first cap in Japan. Um, I just got married, actually. So that was my honeymoon. And uh, my wife and my dad came over and my father-in-law. And um, like my dad's a, a very simple man, a cattle dealer. Um, you know, had no, his father had a stroke when he was 13. So he left school at 13 to, to run the business because um, he was the eldest. Like and just slave to work. I mean, you know, um, I remember when I was a young fella, my mum would have to to, to uh, barter with him so I could miss going to a mart to, to go training with my local GA team. So, um, but friends, for him, for to see his his emotion when I played for Ireland and the effect that had on me um, was phenomenal. And uh, yeah, like that's it's a day, uh, you know, a day I'll, I'll always appreciate. Not for me, more so, but for for him. For my family and and also for my kids, you know, I, I, I know, like, if my dad, if, if I ever was with my dad as a kid and, and he met someone who won all Ireland or, you know, even like oh, his father played for Ireland, whatever, it's just a nice thing, I think, for your family as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that pride. What are the next steps for you now over the next couple of years yeah, after? Um, so I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this whole area of, of high performance coaching um, and working with coaches. So I'm working with some coaches across different um, different codes um, to try and help them coach better and, and uh, to mentor them a little bit. Um, and I'm just trying to get better, to be honest. I'm, I'm trying to take on as much information as I can and fine tune it along and align it to my own kind of core philosophy, which I think is important. Um, but I'm also enjoying my, my day job. So at the moment, I've got a perfect mix of coaching a little bit uh, invective. Um, I'm, I suppose, working with high-performance coaches who want to get better. Uh, and I have a, a day job that's, you know, fulfilling as well um, in terms of the corporate world. And then I'm looking off, I do TV or radio probably once a week as well, you know, when the, when the games are on. So I'm getting to go to Six Nations games, European Cup games or Pro 14 games and, and get a few quid, but also talk, talk rubbish on it, you know. So uh, um, I enjoy that. I enjoy kind of, going to a game on a Saturday, for a pro game, without having to... Like I'll give you an example. So the Dragons lost this year to Leinster, 50 points to 10. I was commentating on it. Um, put down my microphone, walked out of the ground, had a great weekend. wasn't yeah. had to do with me. Yeah. The year before, I'd been the head coach. We lost by 50 points. And I, I, I still remember it. You know what I mean? So yeah. that just, it, it's nice to get away from that for for a while as well and um, not have everything on your shoulder um, but yeah who knows who knows what happens yeah, yeah good to reassess sometimes well look it's been absolutely brilliant having you on you're our first ever guest on the yeah. Locker Room podcast so you'll always be our first ever guest and we really appreciate you coming on and also all the work that you, you and help you gave us when we were involved with London GA and all it, it really was appreciated I heard Kieran Dunn on a recent podcast saying how he was inspired as a player when you came into the dressing room. So it was brilliant to have somebody of your standing come in and help a group of lads like that. Um, and I, I hope it was a good experience for you as well, you know, to, as you say. So thanks very much for coming on. Remember, just to say to people, uh, subscribe to the podcast. It'll be on all the uh, platforms. Head over to the website as well, dailysportscience.com. And Bernard, it's been an honour and uh, thank you very much for coming on. No worries, lads. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, best of luck with, with all your endeavours. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Bernard.